our Lean Warehousing webinar. Uh, this relates to the course of the same name that we're having October 20th through the 22nd. Today is going to uh, our presenter is going to talk about lean, lean concepts, how they apply to warehousing. Also, um, it's an op your opportunity to ask your lean and warehousing questions. If you are able to, you come to our live course if you find this interesting. And uh, the topics that will be covered as part of that live course, uh, there will be a real high-level overview of those today. With that, I want to go ahead and introduce our presenter. It's Brad Bottoms. He's the instructor for our live course. And he's also Vice President of Consulting for Lean, Lean Core Supply Chain Group. He's got nearly 20 years of third party and logistics experience. Uh, he's got a focus in lean and Japanese production systems. Uh, he leads many consulting projects for Lean Core. They have a lot of Fortune 1000, Fortune 500 customers. Uh, he does all kinds of implementations, uh, warehouse layout, ROI assessments. He's also a speaker and a sits on the borders, part of a lot of supply chain and logistics oriented uh, industry groups. So with that introduction, I'm going to go ahead and turn the session over to Brad. Thank you very much, Andy. Andy Andy's a nice guy. We should put that on there, too. I, I appreciate it. Hey, thanks, everybody. It's, it's a great day in Atlanta once again. In fact, it's a busy day here on Georgia Tech campus. I believe it's a, it's a career fair day. And I, I, I had the opportunity to spend a half a day here last week and interview 22 of some of the most Absolutely brilliant, brilliant young men and women. Uh, wish wish we could hire them all, uh, but we can't. So if you're uh, if you're looking for you know some of the best engineers and certainly from a supply chain perspective, what a great place to recruit from. So this this is exciting. So today's uh, today's webinar we're talking about uh, you know lean lean warehousing and certainly promoting the upcoming uh, certification uh, course at uh, at Georgia Tech here on October 20th to 22nd. So just about a month away, and certainly if you're in the north, it's, a, it's a still nice in the south in October. You might hear my Canadian accent. I, uh, I haven't looked back one bit. Um, on the, on the, the, the list today, just, uh, just to call out you know, some folks, thanks for dialing in. We've got people from literally all over the world, from Liberia to the United Kingdom, Pakistan, Nigeria, Indonesia, Peru. Central America as well represented on this, uh, Ecuador as well, South America, and it uh, looks like there's even some, some one or two people from Canada uh, hometown. So fantastic. Thanks for joining. Um, so just an introduction about who, who the presenters are for the, for the course on October 20th, 22nd. That's, that'll be myself and, and Dave Graham. Dave Graham's the principal of a company called LeanQuest, and we've been teaching together uh, over the past four years now. Our, our companies are very similar in approach. We've got similar customers and uh, similar types of services um, where LeanQuest certainly focuses on that, uh, you know, I've done well developing some of that four walls improvement implementation and uh, training and education. Uh, LeanCore, we've, we've uh, focused really on advancing the world supply chains and certainly inside of that would be, uh, would be warehousing, a big, big, big part of that. So, uh, you know, here's here's some a uh, picture of some of our clients. I mean, there's there's lots and lots and lots, but uh, more importantly, we're we're thought leaders and we're trying to bring the best of knowledge that we can um, in only three days. So um, uh, hopefully, you can join us. And also, it's part of the certification for the for the lean certification. So uh, really, really, really excited uh, excited to be part of this program. Um, so let's just start at the very beginning of what some people think the beginning of lean is. Um, when, we, when we go back to some of the learnings of Toyota, what's often missed is that the, the Toyota people, they actually studied uh, your Henry Fords, your Henry Ford studied your Samuel Colts, and um, you know, Frederick Taylor. I mean, the, the things that we're talking about really aren't all of that new. But what we're trying to do is, is really tie in what we've learned from lean, certainly lean manufacturing, um, to how this would apply to to a warehousing and where warehousing fits in the in the whole big picture, and really taking it down to actionable hour by hour increments or buckets of work that are understandable from both leaders, but more importantly from uh, the the associates that are probably the more you know obviously the more important role in any any given process because they're actually performing the process. So making these processes clear, making purpose quite clear is, is really our purpose of this course. Um, 
I like to you can go back to Toyota's purpose statement. Um, you know, and this is a famous quote. And like our goal at, at, at Toyota at the time: eliminate waste, satisfy customer needs, the lowest possible cost, with consideration and respect for humanity of employees. So there's there's really three elements inside of that brilliant statement that great the great Taiichi Ono uh, coined uh, once upon a time. And what we're what we're really after is eliminate waste being the first the first thing, and we do that. First, we need to understand what waste is, how to identify it. All obviously, all of this is about satisfying a customer. And uh, the the word lean itself, where we're often scared of it because it might mean job reduction and things like that. But it could be nothing more from the truth. We're just trying to eliminate the the waste, get rid of the wasteful processes, know how to recognize them, l learn how to eliminate them, learn how to sustain elimination of those. Before that, even we need to make the the problems even visible. Uh, and know how to do that. And then there's a, there's the last element of the sentence is has to do with respect for humanity of employees. I really I really appreciate this, and and I I can't imagine what it was like in uh, you know Toyota circa 19 you know 60s. I'm sure culture was a little bit different, but but people like myself and my mentors, we've taken this concept of respect for the humanity of employees really to an element of deep understanding of the, of, of of the eighth waste as, as we know it, but uh, really engaging workforce. As we know now, there's depending on what survey you read, there's about 67 to 70 percent of employees that are actually disengaged. So just think about all that waste that's, that's going on outside of our uh, of our grasp. Um, so the, the, with respect to humanity, we believe that people want to go to work, they want to do a good job, they want to be recognized for a good job, and they want stability in their careers. So really, that's that's what this is all about um, at a very high level, at 50,000 feet. So what does this mean? We'll embrace common principles. We'll drive a problem-solving culture, which is what I what I would call a lean uh, company. You know, if I had a, a one-floor elevator ride, but and then we'll teach our people how to identify and eliminate um, the root cause of wasteful processes. So okay, so that's that's what our purpose is, and that's what. Uh, well, that's what this means. Uh, so our results then um, are all about efficiencies, no question. It's about improving revenues, no question. It's about improving profits, no question, no question at all. So our job then is to help challenge you in in a public setting, knowing that all of your supply chains and your warehouses are much different, to a different way of maybe approaching problem solving and making problems visible and uh, flow. With this, with inside the four walls of, of a warehouse, so pretty exciting. Now, this this uh, is a this pyramid sort of has this, you know. By the way, the rule of threes is everywhere, Andy. It's, if you can't explain it in three points, then nobody will remember it, right? But if you kind of you know compare and contrast what uh, cultures are doing uh, most of the time, would be culture on the left hand side is driving how and what we do and why we do things. So there's a call, well, that's just the way we do things. Well, that's the way we've always done it. Well, that's because the boss said so. Could be nothing more anti-lean than the, the other way. We have a purpose. Well, our purpose is to eliminate waste, satisfy customers at the lowest possible cost with respect for humanity of employees. You may even know the sentence. Um, and then that's what drives our values and attitudes, and therefore our culture is developed from, from that. Really, really, really powerful uh, visual if you really get into the details of it and really assess yourself as an organization. We get into this a little bit on day one, um, but if you know, lean and culture sort of go hand in hand, and it's, it's, uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't hit on that. If we spend you know, three days talking about process, and then, then uh, you know, there's, it's, it's culture that holds a process together. So they they're really are hand in hand. So why do we need warehouses then? And I, say, I always get a kick out of this is a great question. Why do we need warehouses? Well, and 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 you you might have a different purpose for your warehouse. I I challenge that you understand what is the purpose of your warehouse. Uh, you know, some different bullets here. Uh, fill rate policies. We need we need to be close to where consumption is. Lot sizes of production. So for example, I need to make a hundred, but I sell twenty five. I need a place to store the additional. Transportation economies is an example that certainly the 
the big LTL carriers and whatnot, they get this. Um, it's cheaper to pick up in batch and then deliver in smaller quantities. Therefore, you need a distribution point. Um, purchasing economies and hedging, meaning uh, you know, certainly if you're in the steel industry or even oil and some of the natural resources, you want to buy low, sell high, but you need a place to actually store things. It's a, it's a reality we know. Uh, demand variability, everything's changing. Certainly if you're in the retail business, you know that you're building up inventory for that busy, busy, busy season, certainly around Christmas and Black Friday and all those special dates. Cycle stock, buffer stock, safety stock, raw material, finished goods, all these different things we need uh, a place to store things. So let's take a step back. And if I were to ask the question, and this is, this is something you can do while you're out shopping next Saturday, certainly. Um, you know, if you're not watching the Georgia Tech football game. Um, the question is, is a retail store a warehouse? We ask that question. I ask that question a lot of times. Nobody's ever, I've never been asked such a question. I don't know what to, what to say. And, and most, immediately the reaction is, no, it's a, it's a store. So I, then I ask, you know, I walk through this story. I said, just imagine if everything we buy is built to order, meaning, okay, I want something. I'm going to, uh, okay, here, I'm, I'm, I've actually got a, a Dunkin' Donuts coffee here right in front of me and the good stuff, a little cheaper than Starbucks, but I do like it. And I was actually, I actually visited one of their ca coffee suppliers last week. This is kind of good timing. They actually, they actually buy the coffee, they, they grind it, they blend it, and then they, they provide it to Dunkin' Donuts. So imagine Dunkin' Donuts if it was built to order. Well, what would have to happen is I would pull up to the drive through window. I would say I'll have a medium coffee, cream and sugar. Well, they would literally have to get the coffee from, I don't know, Columbia, I guess, if that's where the coffee is being built, right? It doesn't make any sense. I, I would literally be sitting at the drive through window for maybe, I don't know, a month maybe, and that wouldn't be very good for, for drive through flow. So we have to have stock near the point of use because people value lead times. People want things right away. In order to get things right away, there needs to be inventory there right away. And that's not just in a retail, but it's also in, if you're an inbound warehouse serving a factory, uh, parts need to be pulled from a, from a facility. Or if you're a distribution point, then strategically, you may have eight to, to 70 uh, different warehouses around the, you know, the globe or the United States just so that you can be near your, your, your customers because it, the big the big topics these days certainly is next day or need I even say same day delivery. It's just amazing that what uh, what companies like Amazon are doing today. And there's more companies doing that. I know we all know we're hearing about Amazon for sure, but that's that's essentially a big reason we have warehouses. Now the problem is it costs a lot of money to store inventory, and we'll do some exercises about that. So there needs to be a really good balance between uh, the size the amount, uh, the, the, and certainly the, the control of, of any kind of waste that goes on inside of warehousing. So I love this visual, and it's a, it's a nice picture. It's a call out of a lot of the different uh, lean, if I, would, if I might say, but just things we should be doing on a regular basis. And if I, was, if I was to assess a warehouse operation, this would be my assessment tool. At a, at a 50,000 foot, these are the things I'm thinking about. And these are the things I would be asking the warehouse leader. How are we slotted? Uh, do we have conveyance? Are we using tack time to calculate number of resources required? And a lot of times the answer is, I mean, very rarely it's, it's all of these things. It's very, very, very rare. However, um, that's the journey, and that's, that's what we're here. There's these different tools and processes and thinking to make things flow absolutely as, as clean and smooth as, as uh, absolutely possible. <coughs> Excuse me. So here's an example of a, uh, of a warehouse assessment that I was part of maybe a year ago. And I, I think it's, uh, excuse me, <coughs> the allergies. I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's interesting to point out that the typical problems that we typically find are inside of whether it be uh, right sizing or specifically the layout. <coughs> Most of the time, that's what we see. So if that's the fact, then we need to understand 
what goes into the layout and what goes into the right sizing. So it's typically the same the same implement uh, issues every single time. Always always the same the same uh, contributors. So <coughs> so I, I, it comes to this this story I like, and really getting down to the heart of the training uh, the the course that we're we're developing and bringing bringing things to a level where we understand all people in the operation clearly what the goals are <clears throat> in short increments. So it reminds me, and it's a, it's a great story I think, but it should, it should really connect uh, what we're trying to accomplish. So if you're the owner of a football team, I know we're big football fans in the South, if you're the owner of a football team, the, really the big thing that you, you care about and that you're talking about on a regular basis with your co-owners is winning the, the championship or the Super Bowl or really it's about winning the championship. So if you bring it down one level to the coach, what they're talking about on a regular basis is trying to win the game, win the game next Sunday, win the game next Saturday, or Monday Night Football. And all the work that they do is around winning the game. Not talking about the Super Bowl, they're talking about winning the game. You win enough games, you win the Super Bowl. But if you bring it down another level to the players, they've got an initiative to get to the next 10 yards. The next 10 yards. First and 10, do it again. First and 10, do it again. Do whatever you need to do to get to the next 10 yards. So what does this have to do with warehousing? I believe that that's probably where we fail in terms of managing operations. I mean, factories have done pretty well. You know what your hourly targets are, but from a warehousing perspective, we really miss that mark. Um, if you walk into a warehouse today, most warehousing, you look around, you can't really tell if we're ahead, if we're behind, um, what the problems are, um, what the next 10 yards are, what it takes to get to the next 10, 10 yards. Although the language that the leaders would be talking about could be lights per hour, it could be revenue and, and things that, that, that the associates just don't get. They just need to pick parts, pick them right, put them, put them away or, or put them to staging and out the door in the right time and the right quantity and the right quality and the right, essentially 10, 10 rights that we talk about. So what we're, what we're, um, what we're trying to do is build that visibility to the next 10 yards. First and 10, uh, do it again. So I'll give, I'll give some different examples. And, you know, here's a colleague of mine, Anna Bailey. Uh, but, you know, the, the things that need to work, like if you, in typical warehousing, it's not that something really complicated is, is going wrong. Most of the time, and if you talk to, to team members, they'll tell you, my scanner doesn't work, or uh, people aren't cross-trained, or they didn't know what ship they were supposed to be on. Like very very basic uh, elements that I think I think all of you could re relate to. It's common. It's it's almost everywhere. You almost have to rely on these kinds of problems actually happening. So if we believe in making problems visible, because we're a problem solving culture, then let's not let those problems get in the way of our time. Uh, the next ten yards. So everything starts with a plan, as the title of the slide. But you know here you see Anna putting up. Uh, you know, a very simple tool, but where everybody's uh, might be working on a particular shift, what process, what lift truck they're working. So we have an actual plan so that different problems are visible. Over on the right-hand side, you've got this uh, Kelly Carson, Carlson would be the name, but what she might be trained on or he might be trained on or um, not trained on and different things that they can do. So really, really simple tools, but to make make the uh, make the next next 10 yards make make the shift uh, have a plan to begin with so then we work into something that we call hey junka in, in uh, TPF Toyota production system terms uh, but really just we're talking about smaller lots higher frequency level flow and making that work really visible and, and one of the and if you remember the assessment I showed a minute ago one of the typical things we see is that People get a, a day's worth of work, or maybe a four hours worth of work. But if, but what we know from manufacturing is that batch processing 
is bad for quality. Why? Because if anything at the beginning of that batch is wrong, then everything is wrong in that batch. And by the time you catch it, you've already got a batch of wrong products or wrong processes and whatnot. So through through the uh, through the course, we're actually going to develop this, and it's it's amazing. Dave Grand flies in with his big box of blocks, and he's got uh, an incredible setup for a simulation where we're going to literally going to start with, with a traditional warehouse. We've even got pit carts. And we're going to do simulations, and we're going to work our way through creating uh, hey junka or or pit paths and, and making those uh, making quality extremely visible and plan versus actual extremely visible. But you see this in production as well, and there's a picture of a production board right in the middle. Call it what you like. So important element of these things, and this is one of the this is one of the assessment questions: is do you are you using something called tack time? A lot of you heard of this, but I think some of the definition gets construed where people think that tack time is the same as process time. So process time is just that's it's just how long it takes to do a process. It takes 50 minutes, and that's what it is. It doesn't mean that's what the tack time is. Tack time is is driven from that rate of customer demand. So if you think in terms of um, if I have an eight-hour shift and I have eight trailers to unload, then once again, first and ten, do it again thinking, then the first, then I would need to unload one trailer every hour to stay on pace. So eight trailers, eight hours, one per hour, that would be the rate of demand essentially. Now there's a few uh, elements that would go into that a little bit in terms of level of flow and is that okay, standard work, is that stable, but really important is it may take you longer to actually unload a trailer, or it may take less time. So we need to know tack time, and we need to know process time, uh, because that'll help to tell us how many actual resources we would need per shift. Because that's another one of the great questions. I'll tell you, Andy, if there's good questions to have, I mean, it's how many people are in the building right now? How do you know you have enough? Um, are you ahead? Or are you behind? If you can't answer these things, then to me, you're uh, You've got some really big, big improvement opportunities, uh, which we'll, we'll be addressing. So here's an example. I know you've you had a chance to look at this for a minute. If you have one resource on each shift and 100 trailers a day is your trucks per day is your demand. Two shifts, one so one shift would be 420 operating minutes. So we've taken out breaks because people don't work during breaks, and it takes 50 minutes to unload a truck. Then what's the tack time? Then you would you see the calculation. It's just our operating time divided by that required quantity per day. And then the next question would be how many people do we need per shift? So I'll scroll ahead. Actually, I'll, I'll give maybe 10 seconds while, while you uh, muck through this. Very simple calculation, but we'll provide some, some worksheets for you uh, to use and bring back to your own, your own operations following the course. It's uh, not a problem. So here's it, here it is. So very, very simple spreadsheet. Obviously, you can see this is Excel version. Um, we have 100 trailers a day. Um, we work out, take out our breaks, tells us how many, how many, what, what our working time is in a day. And from there, we can calculate our tack time. So that means 8.4 minutes per trailer. That means we need to be processing a trailer every 8.4 minutes. If we're ahead or behind, those are both problems. Behind is behind. Ahead could be overproduction, which which uh, could be one of the worst wastes of all, as, as we talk about. Because working ahead isn't necessarily a good thing. Um, so to calculate our number of resources required per shift, we simply take our process time, so if it takes 50 minutes, divide that by our tack time, and that's what tells us about 5.9 or 16, 16 members per shift. Now, you might say, but Brad, this doesn't make sense. You know, we have, sometimes it takes, you know, 80 minutes to unload a trailer. Sometimes it takes 20 minutes to unload a trailer. You know, and I, and I would say, well, that's, that's good that you know the range of what it takes to, to unload a trailer. This calculation absolutely assumes that standard work or your process time is, is the same every single every single time. So the work then is not around 
raising the water level and hiring more people or getting mad at me because my, you don't like my spreadsheet, the work would be to stabilize the amount of time it takes to unload a trailer. So you might find that the 80 minute ones, well that's because suppliers are shipping with you know, incorrect labels, it could be because Jimmy showed up for, late for work today, I don't know, lots of different reasons, but that's, that's really what, what drives the problem solving is you have a plan and then you get your actual and then you've got a gap. And what is that gap? Um, how do you, how do we how do we fix it? It's good stuff. Here's some different visuals. You know, um, a nice nice lean warehouse uh, is a is a, is a self-explaining operation. We know how we're doing. We know if we're ahead. We know if we're behind. And that's everyone in the operation, not just the guy that happens to have access to the Red Prairie or whatever fancy system you're using. You know, and, and there's some really great tools out there. Don't don't get me wrong, amazing tools. But these simple tools work well also. Whiteboards will work for you um, at the fundamental level. And we use technology to help help speed up our, our work, but let's let's make sure we're using we, we understand what we're trying to accomplish in the first place. So the, one of the other comments I made regarding our, our layout. Um, or some of the typical problems of, of warehouse assessments is, and I think you know some of you might might challenge this number. I'm not sure where I heard it. Maybe through uh, Warehousing Education Resource Council or work, I believe. But something like 50%, maybe even more, of all warehouse activity movements are pure waste. Just think about it. Forklifts, people. Um, you know, walking, looking for parts, going to the other side of the building to get parts. Uh, if we've done, I don't know, you know, 10 different warehouse assessments over the last year, 10 of them had recommendations uh, regarding layout. So at a high level, let's, let's take a look at how we do layout. And, you know, there's a very traditional way of doing things. And this, this might, might uh, make you think a little bit. And, as I always say, as an as a, as a educator, my job is to make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. So I don't do that, but I'm not, I'm not doing my job, right? Um, but if you look at the top, we've got a traditional ABC analysis. And ABC meaning A's would be your fast or your, your, your big volume, B would be middle, C would be not so much. Um, so if you were A's, let's like say you worked at General Mills, A's would probably be your Cheerios if you worked at Hugo Boss, it would be your men's blue shirts. Um, you know, if you're, you're at Ford, it would be the, the F-150. Um, you know, and so on and so forth. So traditional ABC analysis would take quarterly volume, typically, and sort uh, descending. And then we, we do a Pareto, or a, you know, an 80-20, essentially, and find out what, what the majority of that percentage is. So if you work your way to the right, you'll see that you know, 4,800 and 1,400 and 900 work up to be about 70% of the quarterly volume. So therefore, that would be your A SKUs, right? Well, and what we do with them, we put them right in the front of the warehouse. The problem is, is it doesn't take into account uh, seasonality, it doesn't take into account the fact that we only touched it once over the last, there was one big order this last quarter, uh, and many, many different other things you know, to, certainly to challenge engineering. And there's many ways of, of re-challenging, and that's really what Loon's all about, is having that collaborative dialogue, uh, but at least understanding the inputs. So from a, from a flow perspective, and that's really what we're after, the little waste, maximal, maximum flow, um, we, would, we would understand, we want to understand what coefficient of variation is telling us. What coefficient of variation is, is just that, that average distance to the average of, of touches or of, of movements. So for example, if I'm touching something every single day, um, then my variation would be literally zero. It's every single day, it's the same. Um, and as you work your way up to 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and all the way to you know, one, you're like, so basically what we're saying is our variation could be 10%, 20%, 30%, all the way up to 100%. 100% being a lot of variation, to 230% being a, one heck of a lot of variation. So, so what does this mean? What it means is 
parts that we cut, if we're moving every single day touching these parts, then they should be our A's. We would sort our coefficient of variation ascending, put our A's in the front, and our B's and C's would work their way to the back. And of course, there's, there's viscosity that would be associated with this too, but, but it's a much different result than what by volume would tell us. Um, so at the heart of, of lean engineering, this coefficient of variation is a very, very, very important input. So is Pareto analysis, very, very, very key. Good stuff, Ian? Yeah. Um, so I like the, I've been trying to break my, my, my lean speak into very, like lean 101 and lean 102. 101 I already talked about is the idea of we have first and 10 and we do it again and making that visible and connecting that to, to, the, to the home run or the winning the Super Bowl. Now, the second, you know, lean 102 for me, lean thinking 102 is really about inputs and outputs. So if we are problem solvers and we're lean thinkers, we're process thinkers. So y is a function of x. Good old calculus. They even taught us this in, in Canada, if you can believe it. Uh, believe me, um, I didn't think this would, be, this would be important growing up, but now I really, really get it. From a lean perspective, it would be, it would be insane that the Y is ever going to change without changing the X. So as we change the inputs or the X's, then our outputs essentially change. So lean thinkers rare, rare, very rarely are talked out of not asking or looking into the inputs of certain metrics or certain outputs. For example, our, our warehouse shoots out, uh, you know, and you hear these dialogues and, you know, from, certainly from senior leaders that we're at 15 lines per hour or, pa or packages per minute and really don't know what, what it means. You can benchmark it and understand how other businesses are doing or maybe other facilities in your business are doing. However, what really matters is, is what it took to get to those specific numbers and how could you do better. So, for example, we're at 15 lines an hour. But we also have huge supplier conformance issues, and we have we're shortage of employees or training. Like these are all inputs to, to effective um, flow. I've also got this, these fun little questions. Uh, is a, what is a principle? Is a principle an input? So it's so a principle. You know, and, and at the heart of lean thinking, there are, there are principles. There are things we believe in that we don't need data to tell us it's the right thing to believe. We, for example, quality at the, sto at the source, that's a principle. Uh, we believe in standards. But principles themselves uh, are absolutely inputs. If we all believe the same things, we believe that waste is bad, we believe in respect for humanity, we believe in not passing on bad, uh, on errors because when we do that they become defects and they flow through the value stream and pick up more waste like thumb, like like uh, tumbleweed. Um, what an what an amazing culture we could actually we could actually have. And I can tell you certainly at, at Lean Corps that is our mission is to build a, a principle based organization. When you have that, it's just alignment is such an amazing thing. But always the goal. Um, certainly, what I believe is that 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 should be leaders' goals to drive that that principle based organization. But also bring it down to a level, to a first and ten level, makes sense. I have ten orders to get out in the next hour. Um, what do I need to get to make that happen? And as leaders, that's your job, is to make make your team successful, your reflection of your team. Simple as that. Leaders go see and do. Uh, I mean, how, how, how on earth can you be successful without truly knowing what's going out on the floor, uh, what's happening on the floor, what, what, what some of the employees are actually dealing with. Um, and we call this in, in Japanese uh, production system speak, we call that going to the Gemba, uh, or where the place uh, where the work is being performed. You can call it whatever you like to. You can come up with a nice name if you want to. But really, the principle is that we are watching, helping, um, making, helping make people very, very, very successful. And it's really, 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 really important. I was hoping I'd, I'd have my uh, my famous Barry Melrose slide 
So if, if anybody's a hockey fan out there, you remember Barry Melrose was a coach. And he's got this, this really awesome quote that says, uh, the leader's job, or his job as a coach, is to make sure that there are no excuses for the players. Um, so the bus arrives on time, the, the skates are sharpened, the sticks are there, the tape's there, there's cold, there's warm water in the shower. I mean, everything exists so that the player's job is to do nothing but play the game, play the plays, have nothing else on their mind but, but do just what the plan is. Amazing quote. Because when you think about it, you ask five different leaders, and certainly warehouse, you ask them what their purpose is, a lot of it's different, you know. And to me, operational excellence is just that. I mean, we need to make sure we understand exactly what our teams are going through and why they can't uh, meet the expectations that literally we're, we're setting for them. Um, you'll see this, this bar graph at the, at the bottom left-hand corner. And this is, this is real stuff, Fanny. We were, at Lean Corps, we were, we're op managing an operation for, uh, for a customer. And it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's got every bit of lean activity. It's picking, it's sequencing, it's kidding. And you can see back in 11, January 11, we we're, you know, our errors were just way, way above uh, acceptable levels. And, and once again, like the difference between an error and a defect, and this is really important. Uh, an error is a mistake. Everybody makes mistakes. No matter who you are, um, we know that you're going to make mistakes. And I, I mean, it's just, it's just, unless you're Donald Trump, you make mistakes, right? <laughs> now, on the other hand, when you give a mistake to somebody else, it becomes a defect. Really important that you live by the, the rule. And there's three things. Never give one. Never, ever, ever, ever take one. And the third one is, listen to the first two. <laughs> I had to come up with a rule of three. Never, never give, a, never give uh, uh, an error, never take an error. Bottom line. Yes, and problem solving is a language. Um, you know, we live in a world of A3s and Six Sigma and PDCA and all these different things uh, that, that exist out there. I don't know that any are better than the other. I mean, you know, you could really have some good debates, and, and there's a lot of thought leadership going into into it. But the, what's more important is that you actually do have a language for solving problems, so that you know team members have a uh, a venue or a, an angle or a direction or really a process to follow when things aren't going wrong. That's your job as leaders is to provide that that that. Uh, if you want to be in continuous improvement. Uh, uh, culture, then you need to have uh, continuous improvement processes. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll talk about problem solving a little bit in the course. And uh, um, you know, I'd love to hear some of your examples as we get to know each other, um, you know, what works and what's not working for you. Um, to me, it really just comes down to the questions that we ask. Uh, you know, and you'll see this, this ORLO acronym, Operate, Review, Learn, Optimize, Execute. This is, this is one example of of uh, problem solving that we use, but but for me, I'm more focused on the questions that we ask our, our people and the different, uh, the dialogue that we engage with them in order to A, show them respect, but B, help them solve problems. Uh, the first question, you know, is a great question. Outside of safety and containment would be, is there a plan in place? Is it visible for everyone to see? That would probably be part B of the first question. And then the second one would be, are we actually following that plan? Are we following that process? You know, and, and a lot of times we find that, you know, people pick differently, people pack differently, people ship differently. I mean, that's a problem. And what we would argue is that let's standardize these processes before we get into the mountains of rework and problem solving when if we were just following the same process in the first place we wouldn't be having you know a lot of the issues that we're actually seeing really really uh, fundamental stuff you know what what uh, what we've added to the course this year too Andy is a, a really focused value stream mapping exercise that's for specifically for warehousing and we, we didn't, uh, a couple of years ago, we thought, you know what, we'd be remiss if we didn't teach mapping the warehouse. So you, you see some very simple, some, some uh, butcher paper, they call that, and just 
you know, just some paper roll out and we see some some post-its, but we try to get very interactive and teach folks how to map processes in a warehouse. And the value stream map is important because it's really about the cross the interaction of departments or, or you know sub departments inside of whether it be in a complete supply chain, but certainly in four in the four walls of a warehouse. You've got receiving, put away, uh, inventory control, picking, uh, shipping, trucking, and, and, and all kinds of different elements. Uh, that, that are responsible for both material and information flow. So we'll, we'll provide a case study and we'll coach you right through uh, being able to see the heart of where we need to focus uh, on in terms of uh, in terms of problem solving. And by the end of course you'll, you'll know how to do this and we'll encourage you to, to do this in your own your own operation. Very simple but very 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 powerful. Certainly the art is in the facilitation, not in the tool. And as we always say, we want to build stability outside of our four walls before we do our of our inside of our four walls. I, I just I pulled this slide in here just because I wanted to show that, you know, this is an actual this is an actual trailer yard uh, diagram. This is from my earlier days of being a logistics coordinator in the automotive industry, and we had planned for trucks to arrive sometimes four or five hours before they're actually due to the door of the warehouse. Why? so that we could manage stability inside of the warehouse. And it just seems odd to people from in some cases, but sometimes you need to create a little bit of waste to prevent a lot of waste downstream. So this goes back to the, the rule of defects. Um, if we didn't build in this buffer time, then trucks could be showing up late, which would mean you know, 50, 100 people sitting in a warehouse waiting for, for work to do. What a horrible waste, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and certainly on the, on the metrics we get into, um, and, and you guys can just scroll through these, but it's, a, it's an attempt to, sh to compare lean measurement systems and traditional measurement systems. And remember what I said, uh, we really want to understand as real time as possible if we're ahead or behind, if we have problems, if we need to do anything to change for the next hour, because we want to get to the next 10 yards. So in traditional, in traditional measurement systems, we don't know any of this information until it's too late. We're not measuring the system. We're measuring, uh, you know, only departments, which doesn't make sense. And, I, and I'll give you a comparison. Um, there's there's well-known box companies that that have uh, a lot of them are the same. Their goals are to reduce transportation costs as much as possible, reduce warehousing costs as much as possible. Well, that makes sense, right? What doesn't make sense is pushing. Uh, you know, trucks to warehousing when, when warehousing can't even accommodate the trucks or doesn't have visibility when the trucks are coming in. Um, these are problems with the system. And quite frankly, it's not going to work without uh, understanding uh, what's going on outside of the four walls of a warehouse. It's very, very common. Who's working on supplier conformance? Who's making sure the trucks are going to show up in, on time? Who's making sure? Who's making sure of these different things and building them into our management system? Very simple problem-solving board. I really like this. This is this is my last story, and I'll I'll hand it over to you, uh, Andy. The uh, this is a this this is a, a very visible employee suggestion system that actually replaced. You want to guess what it replaced, Andy? Uh, computer system or some signage? Or Close. Yep. Yeah. It, it, it replaced a lockbox, you know. And, and in this day and age, I can't even I can't even understand why on earth we would have locked boxes for employees' suggestions. That doesn't make any sense. If we believe in inclusivity, um, then why wouldn't we put? Why wouldn't we just make the make the suggestions very visible? And you can see there's different departments. People put up a post-it. I mean, by now it's probably, you know, it looks a little bit better. I mean, but you know, this is this is the evolution of great ideas, and the lockbox. Just I just can't. I mean, I get it for for certainly for HR uh, related items, but you know, you just then then what happens? Everybody looks inside the lockbox to see if anybody actually read the, you know, is, is updated. I mean, why do we do this? So really, really nice way of, of uh, engaging everybody, you know. And, and, and I, I tell you, this is a great, this is a great picture right here. 
Um, you know, if you look at this, this is a fax machine that says, uh, please clean your hands before using. <laughs> and look, look how dirty it is. It's just unbelievable. And, and you can see the tape where the, where the sign was put there, and it's actually really clean underneath it. And, you know, I, I put this in here just to say, you know, look, how are we supposed to work on cool things like tack time and layout and coefficient of variation thing if we just can't keep a sorted and clean environment? So we know that in Lean it's 5S, but you know if we're still talking about 5S, uh, you know like at least the first couple S's of keeping things clean, then we still we still we ju we're just not going to advance. I thought this was this was kind of fun. Does this you think will succeed in a future stage? <laughs> I don't think so. I, when you see stuff like that, you just know there's we're probably we're probably need to need to keep sticking with the basics. So okay, well thanks, Brad. I, hopefully that gave everybody a little taste of lean, how you can apply <coughs> lean principles to warehousing. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to get them in now. Just type them into the question slash chat window. Um, I know that we had one question that related uh, to the tack time example. It was, uh, for tack time, do we use average demand over a period of time or forecasted demand? That's a great question. Um, I, I would, uh, so that, first of all, the question uh, insinuates that demand changes, right? So that there becomes uh, an element of where tack time, um, you, you just have to do some modeling essentially. So if I was to, if I were to predict how many people I need over the course of the next few weeks, I, the first thing I would ask is what, you know, what the demand is. Um, so I would use demand. However, uh, I would also really want to understand what worked in the past. Um, so looking, looking back, we have, we have a period of time over the last few weeks or a few months. Um, you know what? That'll tell us what we were able to accomplish essentially. But it, it's really the process time is really key. I would use the demand to forecast the amount of resources I need. But you know, the other, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't say I, I get it. Like the problem with forecasts is that they're never right typically. But the, the shorter, so this is the second rule of the forecast is that the shorter the lead time in the forecast, the more accurate you're going to be. So there, there have been some instances where, where me and my team have recommended that we do tack time calculations almost on a daily basis because throughout the days it's, it's not going to be the same. Um, if you can't stabilize demand, uh, which is in most cases of the warehouse operation can't, but we get outside of our four walls and try to try to stabilize demand throughout the week. So for example, if you have you know, 10, uh, 10 uh, inbound trucks and outbound trucks on Monday and you got 40 on Tuesday and 12 on, on Wednesday, I mean, that's just a huge instability problem that, that we need to, to work on. But okay. what a great question. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Um, I guess we got another, we uh, received another question. It's, uh, do I need formal lean training to attend the course? Yeah, that's a, yeah. So we've we've learned that there's been a lot of people that have come to the class that haven't had any any formal lean training at all. And in fact, most probably 90 percent of the students that have been to the course have had very little. So what we what we we've, we've added a component of of lean overview on day one. Um, you know, in, in a fun certainly fun uh, format. Um, but we're also you know we're here to help. So. If there's preparation uh, that you, if you're not comfortable with leading up to it, that's please reach out to us. It's certainly me. I'm I'm here to help. But we will build in uh, the, the you know lean fundamentals uh, curriculum on day one of the course. Okay. Uh, another question we received: What is the difference between lean warehousing and just warehousing as we know it? Oh, that's a good. Yeah. So <laughs> what a great. Well, I, I, I revert back to just the principles. And in principle, um, if you go to an airport, you know where you need to go, what you need to do, if it's a good day or a bad day at the airport, um, the direction, uh, where things go, where you sit. Like, everything is well organized at an airport. Now, you might argue with me because things are late and early, but, but 
you go to a warehouse and you just don't know what's going on. Like to me, the very basic things that lean warehousing is doing is it problem the plan is visible, the actual is visible, and the problem solving is visible. We know what problems we're working on over the next hour and six months, so there's short term and long term, but we also know status of operations. And that's to me that that's the most most important thing. Certainly things are clean. I hope I don't have to say that, right? But uh, but yeah, okay. great question. Um, this question, it looks like it relates to the previous one. Is there a number of years experience required to attend the course? No, no, we will try to, this is not um, an engineering, the warehouse type of courses. Uh, there's some other courses that are at the, at, at the Georgia Logistics Supply Chain Institute that are really specific about getting into detail. This, this would be a course for you if you're not an engineer, but really want to understand the dynamics of warehousing, um, and you might um, you might benefit from because you're in a position where you can actually encourage change in processes and, and, and the way the way that we actually approach warehousing in general. Um, but you know, the, getting down to the analytic, like the, the deep engineering, that's that's not the purpose of the course. The purpose of the course is about creating flow uh, within uh, storage situations. Okay. So last call for questions. Um, I see we had a couple that we'll, uh, we'll get back to the folks after the session and, uh, and get into that. Um, if you don't have any more questions, I mean, please note that uh, you can always shoot them over to us at webinar, W-E-B, I-N-A-R at scl.gottech.edu if you think of them after we uh, after we end today, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Um, hopefully you found this interesting. Uh, if the topics are something that you want to delve uh, more into, again, we have our course coming up October 20th through the 22nd. Uh, that's going to be here in Atlanta, Georgia, on the Georgia Tech campus. It's in the Global Learning Center. It's a nice state-of-the-art um, uh, facility. It's, uh, most people stay in the Georgia Tech Hotel, which is connected. You just get up. You have breakfast, walk across the bridge, nice rooms, they have technology. Well, they, they feed you well, too. It's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's no problem for, for snacks and lunch. Um, uh, just to note, you'll see that we have a presence on social media. So uh, if you, you know, look for us on Facebook, Twitter, if you do a uh, search in Georgia Tech Supply Chain and LinkedIn, you'll see a couple of groups you can join and, and get engaged with our community. Uh, we have a YouTube channel as well that you'll find uh, some archives of some archives of some other webinars. Uh, you know, note that this lean where we have a whole lean professional series as well. Um, this course is actually part of our distribution operations analysis and design certificate series, but we also have a separate uh, three course lean professional series. So if you go to um, our website at www.scl.gottech.edu. Uh, you can uh, look under education and find that. So it looks like we don't have any other questions. Uh, again, thanks, everybody. We appreciate you taking the time out uh, to be with us today. And if you have anything, any questions in the future, uh, feel free to, to contact us. Thanks. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. Have a good week.